Hello, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining on uh, joining in on time. My name is Rajiv Jairaman. I'm the founder and CEO of Nolscape and the author of uh, Clearing the Digital Blur. And in today's webinar, uh, we are super thrilled to have Jaspreet Bindra. Jaspreet is a thought leader and the founder of Digital Matters, an advisory firm in the areas of digital transformation, blockchain, and the future of work. His digital transformation experience spans across agri-tech, real estate, next-gen social networks, hospitality, and so on. Until recently, he was the chief digital officer of the Mahindra group of companies. He's a pioneer and expert in the blockchain space in India. I don't know if, you, if you've seen this. His YouTube video and TEDx video on uh, uh, blockchain is inching towards a million viewership mark. Um, I think that's a, an achievement in itself. Um, so he's on the advisory board of several tech startup companies, a Singularity University chapter leader and partner in India, and has been awarded as a digitalist of the year by Mint and SAP. What's also very exciting is uh, next month, he's launching his book, Tech Whisperer, published by Penguin Random House. So we are super thrilled to have you with us, uh, Jaspreet. Over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Rajiv, for those kind words. And uh, 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 thanks for everyone who's, uh, who's logged into the webinar. Uh, what we'll do over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes is that I'll take you through a few uh, slides and comments on, uh, on how I look at digital transformation uh, through my experience and uh, how therefore large legacy companies in India and otherwise can probably look at beginning their and uh, their digital transformation journey. So we're calling today's uh, 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 webinar of the three pillars of digital transformation. And what I wanted to do even as we begun was to just start with this term digital transformation. You know, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this term became a, a bit of a buzzword a few years back, and since then, every company uh, of all of all kinds of uh, in all kinds of uh, sectors has started talking of how they are either undergoing a digital transformation journey or how uh, they can help other companies by under, uh, to undergo this particular journey. But whenever we use the word digital transformation, we tend to use it as one word. It isn't. It's actually two things: digital and transformation. And many times we tend to focus on the digital bit because that's, that's where the technology is. That's where business model, customer experience, that's the, that's, that's the sexy part, if it may. Uh, we often forget that the second part of this term is actually transformation. And that is really where most of the hard work is done. That is the difficult part. That is the hairy bit. That's about people, culture, mindsets, Org structures. It's about the big iron, the IT, and the back end. It's about process and a lot of process modification, a lot of process rewriting, etc. It's hard. And so, what we are going to do over the next fifteen odd minutes is actually, while we talk about both, we might be talking a little bit more on the transformation side than on the digital side. And I also do want to add that, as per Rajiv's uh, uh, introduction, I have always been on you know the 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 practitioner side of digital transformation of having been there and done it. And so some of the things I'm going to talk about are really a practitioner's view, uh, a working manager's view, a leader's view on how a, uh, you know, digital transformation can be done. So one of the things which uh, uh, we do know is that unfortunately, going digital or, or digital transformation is not only about building a website or an app. Uh, you know, 10 years back, if we asked people, asked companies whether they are going digital, they would say, yes, we built a website. In fact, we built an excellent website, which renders super well on a mobile phone also. Five years back, it was about apps. Everyone was building apps and a company would say, yeah, sure, we are doing digital. We have we built an app. In fact, we built 200 apps. Today, if you talk to people, uh, it's probably about bots. Two or three years from now, people will be talking about doing conversational AI. But digital transformation is not just about, uh, just about 
building the website or an app or just about the interface. It actually involves the entire company. It's about people, it's about processes, it's about uh, products, it's about funding models, it's about governance, it's about attitude, mindsets, culture. Uh, it it's actually spans the entire company. And one of the things that I've realized in my years of uh, being involved with or leading different digital transformations is that actually digital transformation is the same as business transformation. It is just that today, if you have to transform a business, by default, you will use digital tools and technologies and therefore call it digital transformation. And if you look at any model, a couple of them which I've reproduced uh, on this slide, the first one is a Capgemini model. It talks about all the things that I told you about digital transformation, how it spans an entire company. If you look at the McKinsey model, which is below, actually, if you kind of look at it a little bit more in detail, you'll find that five out of the 10 building blocks or guiding principles that they have are actually about people and culture. And so digital transformation in my book is almost the same as a business transformation. And therefore the guy who, or the person who needs to lead digital transformation cannot only be the CIO or the CMO or the CDO or the CHRO. It needs to be the owner of the company or the person who leads the company, the CEO or the managing director or the owner. Uh, the other thing which I would like you to uh, like you like to like to convey is that many times digital transformation and digitization are two words which are used interchangeably. We use these two words and mean the same thing, but digital transformation is not the same as digitization. Digitization is an inside out thing. So it's about say, take a process, any process in the company. And if you make that process faster, cheaper, more efficient using digital tools and technologies, you are digitizing the company. And so digitization is inside out. It is far more linear. It is predictable. It is much more left brain and it is about costs and efficiencies. Digital transformation comes from the other side. It comes from the customer end and how, because customers are changing uh, and, and their expectations are changing. And therefore, how do we change our company or transform our company to meet these changed uh, expectations of the customer? And so digital transformation is outside in. It comes from the customer value proposition and it's, it's not linear, it's, it's as, as digitization is. It is also many times far more about revenue than about costs. And it is far more right brain. It is creative, you have to take leaps of faith. So, you know, the example that I tend to give uh, for this is, say if you take Meru, the taxi company. Now, if Meru was to run, and if we, use, if we use digital tools and technologies to make Meru run faster, cheaper, more efficiently, you would be digitizing Meru. But if you were to transform Meru into a Uber or an Ola, then you are digitally transforming Meru. Different things. That is not to say that one that digital transformation is more important than digitization or digitization is not needed or not important. No. Digitization is super important. Uh, but we cannot claim that if we are digitizing is that is the same as digital digitally transforming. And actually, if you look back into your companies, you will find that 90, 95% of the digital work, quote unquote, is actually digitization rather than digital transformation. Many times, you know, in, you know, people ask me that, can this be sequenced? Can we first digitize and then digitally transform? And sure, it can be, but in, in just a few sectors. Most sectors, unfortunately, are today undergoing so much change that you need to do both simultaneously. You might end up digitizing uh, your company over five years and then find that you have digitized the wrong business model. And so, you know, you, we need to kind of uh, do digitization as well as digital transformation together. And both are important, but they don't mean the same thing. So a few years back, uh, when I, you know, uh, in the middle of my 
journey as being a digital transformation practitioner, I uh, had written, I, I wrote down actually 10 things or 10 rules, which I later on called 10 commandments, uh, which as a practitioner, I would look at whenever I would think of digitally transforming a company. These got published in Mint. For some reason, they went viral, maybe because digital transformation is a buzzword or maybe because people like lists. But, but these 10 things uh, are, in a sense, the 10 important things you need to do when you are looking at any digital transformation. Now, I'm not going to talk through those 10 things. We don't have the time. And actually, if you just Google uh, just Preet Bindra 10 Commandments, you will find them. And if you kind of cast a glance at them, you'll see different things. You'll see you know, business value, customer experience, partnerships, people, cultural revolution. Uh, and because they became popular, because they became viral, in all the digital transformations that I was either involved with or would read about, I would kind of see, I would start mapping as to how many of these were actually uh, were actually tick marked, were actually done during a digital transformation. And what I found was that 10 out of 10 would never happen. You know, even with the best of class digital transformation, say Burberry, uh, uh, which kind of transformed itself over seven to uh, over seven, eight years into a completely digital led company, you would tick mark maybe seven or eight out of these 10. But what I also found was that out of these 10, there were three which were compulsory which um, had to uh, had to be done anytime you were looking at any digital transformation and these three uh, what i called the holy trinity or the three pillars uh, are business model customer experience and then capability which is people and culture what i will do over the next seven minutes or so is to talk about the first two pillars, the business model bit and the customer experience part. And then I'll hand over to Rajiv uh, for the last pillar, which is the capability people culture pillar. Uh, so business models. You know, you would have seen a graph like this sometime in, your, in, in fact, many times and, and across industries. Uh, you know, this graph is about the hospitality industries about three years, four years back. And basically what it shows is that, you know, there are these market leaders which are doing well, growing. And then suddenly a new guy comes in and zoop, he's kind of overtaken all of them. Now, in this case, that new guy is Airbnb. And uh, Airbnb came in like a phenomenon, as we know, and, uh, you know, kind of became the number one, at least from a valuation standpoint, very, very quickly, scaled up super fast. Now, there's actually an interesting story behind this, that, uh, uh, that uh, this, this, uh, this is about two and a half, this graph is around three, three and a half years back. And that, that year, Marriott, had a particular, which was the largest hotel chain, had a particularly good year. So they had uh, amazing revenues, great growth, uh, great profitability, stock went up, the CEO was super enthused, super pumped up, excited. And in an analyst conference spoke about how everything was looking so great and that and that next year Marriott would actually up its ante and build 30,000 new hotel rooms. Now, I don't know if any of you are from the hospitality industry, but 30,000 hotel rooms in a year is a lot of hotel rooms. In fact, India probably has 45 to 50,000 such hotel rooms. And so he was talking about building 30,000 in a year. Everyone got even more pumped, stock went up further, everyone went home happy. And then two hours later, a tweet came out from, uh, from Brian Chesky, which basically said, which who's the, uh, who's the uh, founder of Airbnb, which basically said that Marriott wants to build 30,000 hotel rooms in two years. We're going to do that in two weeks. And actually, uh, Airbnb built 30,000 hotel rooms in two weeks. And the reason, and the, the the reason why they could do so was because they follow a business model which was totally different from what Marriott followed. And these new business models, what are called platform models by many people, and here I quote a, 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 a professor or a thought leader in a, a platform business models, Sangeet Paul Chaudhary, are very different from the models that we are used. To. The models that we follow, uh, Sangeet calls pipe models. 
and pipe models are linear where you build something and sell it and so you have cost on one side and you have a revenue on the other you have a raw material on one side you have a finished product on the other you have investment on one side you have return on the other these are linear models where you keep on adding value along this entire pipe in what is called a value chain platform business models are different in models cost and revenue are on both sides both to the left and to the right so i repeat that unlike pipe models where there's cost on one side and revenue on the other side in platform models cost and revenue are on both sides so the same guy who uh, uploads a, who watches a youtube video can go to the other side and upload a youtube video and earn money the same guy who uh, takes an airbnb rents out an airbnb room can go to the other side and actually give out a room for rent uh, the same guy who uh, takes an uber uh, taxi can actually put out his car on the other side uh, as an uber and earn money and so cost revenue on both sides and this kind of changes a lot of things uh, to give you an example if you think of marketing in uh, in uh, uh, pipe models marketing basically only focuses on the customer on one side of the uh, pipe in platform models marketing has to focus on both sides so in uber uh, marketing is responsible both for riders as well as drivers or if you take hr for example in pipe models hr focuses only on the on on people and you know making their own employees happy uh, in a, in 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 airbnb for example hr is responsible even for the host conferences the people who let out rooms and so are these hosts employees not employees so many rules change in platform models and the reason why platform models exist is not basically because of the technologies or because you know travis kalanick got up one morning and said that look let me build a platform model but the reason why every new company coming up is built on the platform model is actually this customers are changing today's customers would rather rent out or share stuff rather than buy stuff so they would rent out a house use an uber or an ola rent furniture for the house uh, if they want to go to, uh, go to a party then rent um, a gucci dress and they would not buy stuff the only thing that they would buy are experiences and also current customers the today's customers are far more concerned about environmental impacts of of different things which are already there and so because the customers are moving towards a shared economy or a, a renting model most companies coming up or almost all companies coming up across sectors today all startups are actually working on a platform model rather than a pipe model and so while this is true for you know startups uh, while i was in mahindra we also tried something as to how a established legacy large incumbent company can get into platforms and we had various uh, experiments one of them was tringo which is where we created an uber for tractors in fact an uber for tractors where uh, it's brand agnostic it's not only for mahindra tractors and obviously while uh, mahindra is doing very very well in the uh, in the uh, tractor industry is a market leader is in 100 countries across the world very profitable business we also knew that everything that moves will move to sharing will move to fleets and that's the this is the one way where we can kind of cater to every farmer in india just rather than a few million farmers that we are selling tractors to uh, various other things we tried in platform models and in fact uh, large companies across the world whether it be gm or bmw or toyota everyone is kind of experimenting with different platform models we don't have time to talk about all of them uh, so i will move to the next uh, uh, pillar which is customer experience and see customer experience is a very interesting pillar uh, one of the things which facebook did for us uh, many years back and which we really don't think about is that it merged our online and offline identity before facebook we used to be a separate persona online and a separate persona offline but now the facebook generation people who are 23 24 years and lesser uh, actually don't think that there is something which is different online and something which is different offline those terminologies only exist in 
you know, our heads, uh, especially in the heads of people managing large legacy companies. And so if you take an Uber trip, for example, you're online and offline so many times during that customer journey, uh, but you never really think about it. Uh, we, on the other hand, legacy companies tend to have a CMO and then we have a head of digital marketing, uh, thinking that the customer when he's offline with the CMO will look after him, the offline guy will look after him. When he's online, the digital marketing guy would look after him. And then we also have a of social marketing, etc. But actually, the deal is that if you map out your customer's journeys, you will find that the customer's uh, expectations from your company are very different from what your company has actually been built for. And, you know, this graphic here shows that. Uh, we tend to make the paved paths. The customer chooses that grassy path. And so, so customer experience or user experience or what the customer wants is very different from what we want. And as we are looking at company after company after company, the companies which get customer experience right are the companies which thrive, which earn money. And customer experience is actually emerging as the only differentiator. And so, uh, so to give you an example again, uh, you know, when at Mahindra again, uh, we, we mapped out uh, uh, auto buyer's journey. I mean, we had built a good auto business, but we realized that it was built for an era and for a kind of customer who, who had almost disappeared. And we learned many things. And one of the things we learned was that uh, a customer uh, had, in fact, 70% of customers had already made their decision on which car to buy before they even entered a showroom. And so showrooms were almost redundant. The only reason why people went into a showroom was to test drive a car. And also e-commerce had made people, had spoiled customers. So, you know, people wanted stuff to come home. And here we were making these massive showrooms across the country on high streets, each, each showroom losing money. And so one of the things that came out in the new customer mapping to give a new customer experience was a product which uh, Mahindra has rolled out in a few cities called uh, Take the Showroom Home. And what that meant was that basically uh, a car would come, uh, would come to your place for you to test drive. And then there was a VR headset, which you wore to find out, you know, if you wanted to look at other colors or other variants, other models, etc. And so this was a completely new business model based on a completely new customer experience. And if this model were to work, imagine the amount of cost savings uh, and the changes that would happen in the auto industry and in Mahindra Auto. And very frankly, Tesla has already taken a lead on this. They realize that people don't need showrooms any longer. And so they have these little shops and malls where you can go look at a Tesla car, uh, but you can't still buy the car. You have to buy the car online. And we tried taking it to the next stage where you actually take uh, the showroom home. And so these two pillars to conclude, the business model pillar and the customer experience pillar are compulsory pillars of digital transformation. Uh, you have to address them. And in many times, the essence of digital transformation really is what business model it follows and how you can relook at that business model based on customer needs. And secondly, if you kind of can map out what is your customer's what customer real journey versus what is the what is the experience that you offer and if you can start bridging these gaps using mostly digital tools and sometimes offline processes you basically have transformed your company so these are the two pillars and for the third pillar uh, i will hand over to uh, to uh, i will stop sharing here and hand over to rajiv rajiv over to you Thanks, Jaspreet. That was uh, very, very insightful. I do have a few questions on your presentation. We'll get to that a little later. But I do want to uh, speak a little bit about uh, the people and uh, culture aspect. Let me quickly share my screen with you. Okay, so um, culture plus competency. So at Nallscape, we um, have this simple formula to drive uh, digital outcomes. Strategy plus capability plus culture equals digital outcomes. So firstly, you need a digital strategy as uh, Jaspreet was talking about. Uh, you do need a clear view of the business model. 
and uh, and the customer experience part. And once you have that in place, you need to start thinking about what capabilities do I need internally and what sort of culture do I need to build. But before we get there, I just want to present um, a couple of things to you. Um, Enter the era of digital blur. So clearing the digital blur is uh, the name of the book I published earlier this year. It came out in the month of March, published by Wiley. Uh, digital blur, um, blur is ac actually an acronym which stands for Boundaryless organizations uh, think about how organizations today are operating more like organisms instead of uh, more like machines that used to be the case in the industrial age today uh, organizations are operating like um, organisms and organisms grow virally as we know they grow in ecosystems so you know ecosystem thinking is a big part of being a boundaryless organization and these ecosystems are today built through platforms so that's uh, B of blur and L uh, actually stands for limitless digitization. Today, anything that you can think of, uh, quite literally anything can have an existence in the digital world as a digital twin, as G would call it. Um, the chair that you're sitting on, the table that you are uh, currently using, your book, um, your, your TV, everything um, potentially can become limitlessly digitized. So we are entering an era of uh, limitless digitization. That means a lot of things from a leadership capabilities and culture perspective. Unbounded innovation is really the industry boundaries blurring away. By the way, the whole premise of the book is that many lines that we are used to from the industrial age have started blurring away. Boundaryless organizations is all about the organizational boundary blurring away. Limitless digitization is where the line between the physical, digital, and the biological, that's blurring away. Unbounded innovation is all about the industry boundaries blurring away. Now think about um, the connected automated cars. If you think about what sort of industries have to rethink their game when uh, connected cars become uh, mainstream, very quickly you will be able to identify that insurance providers have to uh, rethink their game, parking lots, drivers, transportation companies, logistics companies, infrastructure on the road has to change uh, because of this. So one of these innovations has such a profound impact on many industries all at one go. So that's, I think, um, a, a feature of uh, digital transformation. It's not just impacting one industry at a time. It is having an overarching impact on many industries all at once. And relentless iteration is uh, the time boundaries uh, blurring away, the now, the new, and the next. Right? Usually uh, an organization has a view of um, you know, what the now should be, what should we do now to grow and what is um, the, the new that we should work on and what is next. Uh, if you take the example of Uber, right now they um, are adding more drivers and cars to their network and that's the now, that's how they grow. Uh, but already they are thinking in terms of driverless cars, that's probably their route to prof profitability, if at all. Um, and while all of this is happening, they're already launching uh, the next, which is the flying taxis. And on that front, they will be uh, competing against Boeing, which is one of the largest airline manufacturers in the world, right? So, so the now, new, and the next, all of these are happening basically in the now. So organizations that succeed are the ones that are able to manage the inherent contradictions that the three approaches uh, present usually, from budgeting to the talent, to the time frames, to the incentives. A lot of things have to be thought through for the now, new, and the next to coexist. So essentially, that's the idea of uh, the digital blur. So now, when you peel the onion a little bit and start thinking in terms of what should be the strategic response of an organization in response to um, uh, digital blur. Firstly, in response to becoming boundaryless, organizations have to think of themselves as an ecosystem that is in line with what Jaspreet was just mentioning, uh, Sangeet Paul's idea of um, pipelines to platforms, right? And that's essentially all about building an ecosystem. Data should be core part of your strategy. Um, so today, large organizations are sitting on top of a lot of data, not knowing what to do with it. Design a strategy. Essentially, organizations today have become facilitators of their respective ecosystems. So you need to understand the cause and effect that can happen between different components of that ecosystem. So by default, design is a strategic element. And agility is strategy, not just from a project management perspective, but also from a strategic direction perspective, can organizations start becoming agile? So those are the four strategic responses. 
one key insight here is you would realize that in large incumbent companies each one of these uh, dimensions is actually delegated to a functional entity data is what my it team does design is what my marketing team does agility is what my devops uh, devops folks do right so that's a sign of disruption until and unless these four elements are discussed at the board level the cxo level i think um, you know that that's that by itself that's a sign of disruption if senior leaders are not talking about these four things as part of their board level agenda and so what are the leadership competencies so in response to blur obviously if you are a leader of a boundaryless organization the key competency that one needs to possess is that of an orchestrator the ability to orchestrate ideas people resources money and in seamlessly operate across different boundaries both internal and external to the organization right so those boundaries must blur away limitless digitization um, the leadership persona here is that of a sense making leader i'm sure you've read this uh, stat somewhere 90% of world's information was created in the last 2 years this comes from an ibm research but the catch is this this research was done in 2013 by now in 2019 i'm sure this is not Two years anymore, it's much shorter, right? And that's the uh, the age that we are living in, constantly bombarded with a lot of data. And today's leader has the responsibility of uh, separating the signal from the noise, the ability to connect diverse dots and make sense of what's going on. And also, there's a uh, an element of storytelling. Once you've made sense of what's going on, can you uh, transmit to this to the other people? Uh, through compelling stories so that's uh, the uh, sense making leader persona then the design leader essentially thinking about the incentives not just for your own employees but for the entire ecosystem zomato has to think about the delivery boy uh, right and and what incentivizes them otherwise their brand is at stake so that's uh, essentially the role of a design leader uh, constantly thinking about the entire system rather than their own pipeline and relentless uh, iteration agile leader again from a personal competency standpoint learning agility which is um, uh, so talked about in today's context the ability to unlearn and relearn uh, new ideas uh, back in the industrial age a leader could adopt a mental model and stick with it for the entire career right for 30 years you don't have to refresh your uh, mind on any topic at all but today the uh, shelf life of a mental model is about 18 months right and that's uh, following the uh, the semiconductor industry logic as well uh, the moore's law your mental models have to change every uh, 18 months so we need agile leaders today and thinking about culture right and there are deep implications of uh, cultural change as well so when you start operating like a boundaryless organization operating an ecosystem one needs to be um, open peering which is collaborating doesn't matter which person which team the ability to collaborate seamlessly across borders and to be able to share uh, information in the industrial age if you got something that was valuable your immediate tendency was to hoard it in today's context you would share it right so that's a a, a cultural shift limitless digitization uh, data driven is probably a little too harsh i would say data enabled culture um and there is this uh, acronym that's doing the rounds uh, on the internet the way we make uh, decisions today in organizations follows what is called as the hippo model h i p p o and hippo uh, stands for highly paid person's opinion right and that seems to be the way we uh, make decisions inside our uh, companies but hold on uh, hippo has been replaced already hippo is outdated now uh, zebra is the new thing uh, zebra is nothing but uh, zero evidence but really arrogant right so uh, you know just a humorous thing but uh, that's a reality of the day where we are making a lot of decisions without adequate data points uh, imagine having an ibm watson sitting inside your boardroom and challenging leaders on different decisions that are being made that's going to be a completely new culture altogether and for unbounded innovation to be able to operate across industry boundaries we need to be diverse and inclusive not just from an hr agenda perspective but really thinking about inclusivity from an ecosystem standpoint because an ecosystem by default arrives at a win win it has to work both for the producers and the consumers and vice versa so uh, diversity and inclusion has to become part of uh, the culture and um, last but definitely not the least a learn fast or a fail fast culture in a lot of ways if this is not in place none of the other things would take off 
So in, in a sense, we want organizations to uh, develop the experimenter's mindset. Uh, the challenge here is while projects can run in an agile fashion, budgeting is still done annually, right? So you don't have agile budgeting, uh, right, from a business planning perspective. So while at a technology or a project level, things have taken off on the agile methodology, business is still lagging behind, right? So that's uh, essentially on the different, different cultural changes that organizations have to uh, bring about uh, to stay relevant and to thrive in the digital age. So that's something I wanted to share on the third pillar of the Holy Trinity that um, Jaspreet um, you know, spoke about earlier. And let me pause here. Now I change hats um, and I become the, uh, the interviewer and we have Jaspreet with us and who has obviously um, had uh, lots of experience as a practitioner. So let's uh, learn from him. I do have a few questions and if you have questions, uh, please uh, drop them on the chat window or the Q&A box and we'll help moderate this. Uh, while the questions start pouring in, uh, let me kick start this with a couple of questions uh, from my end. Uh, just brief, uh, thinking about a mindset change, right? So a lot of leaders say digital is all about mindsets. Yeah. What does it take to drive a mindset change at scale? This is not just about a few leaders changing their mindsets. You need the entire organization to play by a different playbook. Uh, so what does it take to drive different mindsets within the organization? Sure. It's a, uh, it's a question I've often asked uh, Rajiv and uh, it's, it's, as you know, it's probably the single hardest thing to do. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things I have learned in my experience is that digital transformation, you know, does not happen in the, in the office cubicles or in the boardroom or even in the plant or uh, in the marketplace, it actually happens between your two years. Uh, so in your head, that's the place that you have to play at. And I remember in my many years uh, of, being, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, working to make this happen, uh, more than half my time, 50-60% of my time was actually spent on just this one bit of it as to how do you uh, change mindsets. And uh, well, I started by not doing it in scale, where it would be literally person by person by person, and you work to uh, uh, you know have conversations with them and talk with them and try and get them to see a different point of view, especially leadership, especially people who are influencers. But obviously, this cannot be done you know uh, in a piecemeal basis. And so, the two or three things that I have uh, uh, kind of uh, which have worked for me are the following. Number one uh, is that if your company is doing a transformation, it needs to be reflected in the KRAs or the key result areas of the people who are, are directly leading it or directly influencing it. And even people who are indirectly influencing or leading it, even if they are not in the so-called task forces or SWAT teams or whatever. Uh, because unless it's, a, it's an integral part of what you are measured for and rewarded for or punished for, it, you know, the transformation will not happen. And so one is actually being a part of your KRAs. Two, what I have seen works well uh, at scale is making people aware of things that are happening around them. And so actually having, uh, you know, key people going to uh, uh, different companies which have undergone successful digital transformations or even going uh, uh, overseas to uh, some of these uh, newer companies which are coming up uh, is, uh, is, is a very useful way. And the third that I have seen which has worked uh, uh, is actually, uh, uh, you know, incubating new small startup companies with different business models within your own larger company so that you learn how new different business models operate and, and actually take learnings from those and try and apply them to the larger organization. So look, there are many other ways, okay? There are many symbolic ways to do this. There are coaching ways to do this. There are working with uh, external consultants and firms like yours and others to do this. Uh, but these are the three that I would kind of point out as my top three. Okay, wonderful. Um, Sunita Sinha has a question. Uh, I, I guess what she's asking is, all this is great, but where do you <laughs> start? <laughs> okay. No, Sunita, thanks for that question. In fact, uh, you know, when, when I do these in longer time frames, I do talk about this quite in detail. But uh, uh, again, this is my experience and, you know, across sectors and 
uh, over the last few years. I always start with the customer and therefore I always start with the customer journey. Uh, many people will actually come and talk about the fact that you first need to do an audit about your own digital capabilities, etc., which is fine, but that's an internal view. Uh, I always try and look at the external view and therefore there are two things that I start with and sometimes these two things take more than a year. One is, as I said, the customer journey and therefore, you know, you uh, map out uh, uh, customer journeys using various design thinking tools, etc of what the actual customer journey is versus what you offer. And then you see all these gaps and then you prioritize these gaps and start filling these gaps using technology, digital tools and other things. Uh, that's one clear place to start. The second place, which is kind of simultaneous, is that you have to start with the people. Many times what happens is that most companies tend to do the other bits first and then say, okay, fine, we'll take the piece last when we hit that wall doesn't work. In fact, BCG did a survey recently where they polled 79 companies which had successfully done digital transformations. And the question was that how many of these 79 had tackled the people culture issue first? And the answer was 79 out of 79. And so tackling the people culture issue first, making the right teams, getting the sometimes the right talent, freeing up people to do stuff as you're also simultaneously doing the customer journey is the two simultaneous things to do to start. Okay, that's a, a wonderful point, um, just Preet, and, and I do subscribe to that. Uh, then there's a point of view that, you know, CX is not possible without EX. CX being customer experience and EX being employee experience. And they have to almost go hand in hand. Uh, otherwise, at some point, your customer experience is, is going to show a crack. Sure. Um, others, know. please. Uh, feel free to uh, ask Jaspreet uh, tons of questions. He's here with us. Let's make use of uh, the time with him. Arun uh, has a good question as well. Can you please elaborate on the second point you mentioned on changing the mindset? And I think the second mind, uh, point you made, Jaspreet, uh, was about hyper awareness, right? So how do you get people to know about what's happening in the outside world? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm assuming that was the second point also, uh, unless Arun tells me otherwise. But, uh, you know, the second point actually is the one many people do. Okay, so there are, uh, there are uh, uh, many uh, times I see companies uh, doing a lot from an awareness viewpoint. Now, the awareness viewpoint can happen to three or four different ways. One is outbound or external where, you know, leadership teams, higher potential employees, etc. Uh, are taken to, uh, we take them to or people take them to uh, more digital companies or companies which have undergone or are undergoing digital transformation. Uh, sometimes this is, happens in the valley, sometimes it could be in China, sometimes it could be very well in India. But just to see as to what is happening and why is this transformation, why is it so critical and what is really happening in the world around us. Many times we live in our own world and we don't really know. And so that's one. Second is more internal and therefore getting in uh, experts, getting in people to talk about what's really happening in the business across the world, what companies are doing and therefore what they should do. And, uh, you know, uh, Rajiv mentioned Singularity University, who I partner with. So Singularity does this with law and I do it with them. Uh, and, you know, they kind of curate something which gives you this view of what's happening in the business and more importantly, what will happen in the future in the sector that you're in. For example, again, Rajiv spoke about driverless cars. And frankly, driverless cars is not something which only the auto sector needs to be concerned about. It's sectors across insurance, real estate, hospitality, airlines. Everyone is, everything is going to change with driverless cars, but people don't know that. And so that's the second way. The third is uh, coaching. And, uh, uh, you know, I am a, a, I'm a, I'm a I'm a certified coach and so I know the power of it and coaching uh, senior management uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis because, because digital transformation uh, flows top down many times. The, the CEO, uh, the owner, as I said, of the company owns it and therefore he or she needs to be convinced about it or the board needs to be convinced about it. And sometimes you need to, sometimes someone needs to come and coach them. And so that's a third way. And there are a bunch of other ways, but we have many more questions, so I will stop here. 
Okay, so um, many uh, other questions have flown in. Um, the third point, I guess, uh, just we just spoke about as well uh, from a coaching perspective. And Sunil Bansal asks this question: How should age-old uh, or old-age consulting companies transform themselves in changing times? That's interesting, uh, and probably uh, you know uh, Rajiv is running a new age consulting company in that sense, so maybe. Uh, but uh, uh, look, all I would say is only one thing here: that look, consulting uh, has been in many ways a black box. You know, it's 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 very centralized in the sense that a, a consulting company, a large good consulting company, comes to you and says that you know what, we'll do everything for you. Uh, we have all the capabilities. Um, pretty much like everything else, things are disaggregating and uh, uh, decentralizing. And in this world today, with all these new, with all these millions of things happening, new technologies coming in every day, you can't be good in everything. And so I believe that the consulting companies, which will be the consulting companies of the future, and some of them have started emerging, are ones which will be an ecosystem rather than a black box. And therefore, leveraging a lot of partnerships uh, to make this happen. And I know Rajiv's company does that. I know I do it. And you know, we, and there are bigger companies than us which, which do that. But there are many other, uh, you know, again, there are many other uh, points I can use to answer this question or I can talk about. But, but I think ecosystems rather than black box is the way a consulting company needs to change to. Sure. Um, Sunil also has a, a more um, uh, granular question, which is in terms of what quick skills should we pick up as individuals while organizations are transforming themselves at their own pace? What can we do from an individual perspective? Great question, Sunil. Uh, I believe that the era when an organizational organization would train you new skills, especially tech skills, change skills, awareness has gone. And we as individuals need to actually go out and pick them. And so look, I'm not a young man, but you know, uh, Rajiv talked about blockchain, for example, I picked up blockchain, frankly, in my mid 40s. And it's not the it no one trained me for it. So, you know, you need to kind of go out and get these skills yourselves. And there are today the advantages that there are multiple ways to do that. And if there were a few skills, two or three skills that I would focus on, uh, I would definitely focus on learning about a couple of new technologies. AI is actually number one in that, and then maybe blockchain and a couple others, uh, number one. Number two, I would focus on the whole agile uh, uh, way of working and agile organizations and agile uh, methodology, which also I think Rajiv talked about a little bit. And third, I think I would, I would work a lot on and focus a lot on how to manage change and change management and how to manage change within your organization. There are many softer and harder ways to do that. So those are the three quick skills that I can think of. So you will see that some of them are technology oriented, but many of them are not technology oriented. And Sapan Agarwal has this question. How does this platform concept look in the HR world? Um, I would not know, to be honest. So I would probably leave. I mean, I haven't studied that. And one of the things I, as I told you in my last answer is that everyone can't know everything. So this one, I don't know. So okay. Rajiv, maybe you want to take it. And just uh, before you take it, I'll uh, be concise uh, with this one. So there are many organizations that are uh, starting to look at, um, especially this is true in large consulting firms. Uh, Accenture calls this the liquid workforce. Um, and there are multiple platforms that are evolving, much like Uber, where you have uh, a need on the one hand and the provider on the other hand, how do you do the matchmaking, right? So similarly, uh, work is getting parceled out into smaller projects uh, with projects on the one hand and consultants on the other. How, how do you match them, right? It's becoming uh, more of a platform play within uh, the HR function. And al also this entire um, employee experience, just like we speak about customer experience, employee experience is also very fragmented today from hiring to onboarding to talent assessment to talent development, all of these are on different systems and, and the systems don't talk to each other. So we don't have a single view of the customer. So to me, the platform thinking in HR is to start looking at the employee as a, a unified whole instead of, uh, instead of in fragments. So I think that would be a great starting point. 
Uh, Parno has a question. As HR, do you think HR and talent professionals are ready to do this mindset changes? Um, I think it depends on different industries. The readiness uh, from an HR perspective really does vary. Uh, some organizations are way ahead and they are able to drive mindset changes systematically across the organization. Others, um, you know, not so much. So I think it really depends on the industry and the context. Um, just please, another question for you from an industry perspective. Um, how do you see retail industry transforming digitally, especially with the need for customized customer touch points, ethnic wear, jewelry, etc.? Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Rajiv. Uh, look, uh, again, a uh, very vast answer to this question because, uh, in fact, retail industry has been one of the one of the uh, industries which have been in the forefront of uh, uh, digital transformation. And specifically in retail's case, a lot of it has been driven by Amazon and the fear of Amazon, if it may. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a classic textbook case on how a platform approach uh, offering great customer experience uh, is actually, uh, you know, taking over swaths of uh, uh, what traditional retail needs to be. I think just the business model itself and the platform experience uh, is, is one huge way in which the industry is transforming. Having said that, 90% of retail or 95%, depending on the country you are in, is still traditional retail, uh, is, is not uh, uh, you know, taken over by uh, online or platforms. And so there's a huge scope for traditional retail uh, to kind of still you know, look at uh, some of these newer business models. So business model is one. I mean, two, uh, again, looking at the uh, Trinity, the customer experience bit. And uh, one of the reasons why, I mean, the reason why Amazon or, or, or some of those uh, companies like Amazon have been able to succeed is not as much as their uh, pricing or, uh, you know, offering uh, infinite choice is actually, frankly, that they have worked very, very hard on customer experience. And... Uh, the whole experience from search to recommendation to delivery to payment uh, and there's a lot to learn in how that has happened in retail and a lot of conventional retail players have now started borrowing it both from an online and an offline viewpoint walmart for example best buy for example and uh, they are now doing stuff in stores what people thought could only be done uh, traditionally online and finally i would say is that retail is one industry which which has a huge scope to actually leverage data. Uh, retail, uh, 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 you know, uh, like banking or like telecom, turns out massive amount of data, and so there's a there's a huge scope to actually look at this data and uh, uh, slice, dice it, hyper personalize, uh, therefore offerings for your customer. Uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, retail is a several trillion dollar industry, and there are lots of. Uh, different ways that uh, a digital and digital transformation works across these but these were the top three that i just uh, uh, outlined cool that's uh, wonderful jaspreet so we are running out of time unfortunately we will not be able to take all questions uh, apologies for that but um, you know here are the email addresses that you can uh, write to or of course uh, connect with uh, jaspreet or myself on uh, linkedin or twitter happy to engage um, with you in a conversation I just want to uh, end uh, with this particular question that somebody asked. Uh, with uh, digital, what what is, um, you know, this is something that I like to ask people as well. Uh, while all of these are changing, what is that one constant that you think will still continue? Let's say when you look ahead 2030, what is that one prediction that you can make uh, right now? Okay. Uh, I think... Uh to me, that's fairly simple, and it's not my original one, but uh, what uh, you know, many giants in the industry say. Look, at the end of it, the customer still will continue to remain in the center. Everything will be customer dependent, customer focused, and the only way to do transformations is to keep the customer at the center. And many of these new technologies, etc., which are coming in, help us do that. They do not supplant a customer. Uh, business models change because the customer changes. Uh, and so if you can keep continue keeping the customer in the center, not till 2030, but even till 2130 and beyond, and co-create with the customer, you will always win. 
Cool. That was an awesome um, answer, Jaspreet. And thank you so much for that. And thanks, everybody, for joining in. This was such an enlightening session. I, I hope you found value in this. And uh, till next time, thank you so much. And let's stay in touch. Thanks, Jaspreet. Thank you very much, Rajiv. Thanks, everyone, for being here.